Um, we're here tonight to celebrate trailblazing women poets of the village, past and present. And to start the program, I'm going to introduce you to our hostess, Angelina. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, but I want to tell you also about, uh, I'm going to tell you the names of the, the poets who will be reading for you tonight and speaking. Poets and actresses, by the way. Um, Angelina will begin. We have Marie Howe. We have Elaine Equi. We have Deborah Landau. Diana Gett, Stephanie Berger, <laughs> Therese Svoboda, April, April Bernard, and Elizabeth Macklin, and last but not least, Kathleen Widows. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit about Angelina. Each of the poets are going to tell you about the next poet, so I'm going to tell you about Angelina. Uh, she has acted on Broadway, off Broadway, in national tours, and in every venue, venue imaginable, really, across this country, in, in about 50 plays, for which she has won awards and nominations for her acting. Uh, she has uh, won Tony Awards for co-producing, Drama Desk Awards, Outer Critics, I mean, you name the award, the lady has them. <laughs> um, she founded, she owns and runs this theater, and she founded the Cherry Lane Alternative, a nonprofit organization that produces the work of emerging and established playwrights, as well as reimagined off Broadway classics from the Cherry Lane canon. She's created a number of new play development programs, including the, award, uh, the Obie Award winning Mentor Project. And her most valuable credits are Wife by Matt Williams and Mama by Matisse Milliez and Frederick Emerson Williams. Now, join me in welcoming Angelina Fiordalisi. Thank you. Welcome to Cherry Lane. Uh, it is truly an honor for me to be reading with these talented women. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to start with a poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay, Spring. To what purpose, April, do you return again? Beauty is not enough. You can no longer quiet me with the redness of little leaves opening stickily. I know what I know. The sun is hot on my neck as I observe the spikes of the crocus. The smell of the earth is good. It is apparent that there is no death. But what does that signify? Not only underground are the brains of men eaten by maggots. Life in itself is nothing. An empty cup, a flight of uncarpeted stairs. It is not enough that yearly down this hill, April comes like an idiot, babbling and strewing flowers. <laughs> the next piece is a dirge without music. I am not resigned to the shutting away of loving hearts in the hard ground. So it is, and so it will be, for so it has been, time out of mind. Into the darkness they go, the wise, the lovely. Crowned with lilies and with laurel they go, but I am not resigned. Lovers and thinkers, into the earth with you. Be one with the dull, the indiscriminate dust. A fragment of what you felt, of what you knew. A formula, a phrase remains, but the best is lost. The answer is quick and keen, the honest look, the laughter, the love. They are gone. They are gone to feed the roses, elegant and curled is the blossom. Fragrant is the bloom, I know, but I do not approve. More precious was the light in your eyes than all the roses in the world. Down, down, down into the darkness of the grave gently they go. The beautiful, the tender, the kind. Quietly they go. The intelligent, the witty, the brave. I know, but I do not approve. And I am not resigned. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce a woman who is the author.
author of four volumes of poetry, Magdalene, Poems, The Kingdom of Ordinary Time, What the Living Do, and The Good Thief. She is also the co-editor of a book of essays, In the Company of My Solitude, American Writing from the AIDS Pandemic. Her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Poetry, Anyi, Plowshares, Harvard Review, and The Partisan Review, among others. Please help me introduce Marie Howe. just for a couple of minutes, okay? Thank you. Um, do you know, uh, you know, you gotta tell them where she lives. You tell them. No. You tell them. You know, and they say Vincent Malay lived around the corner. Do you know her house? Yeah, yeah. tiny one. The little tiny, tiny house, it's really a half a house. <laughs> How many people have owned that house in the last 25 years? Oh my God, there's probably, yeah. Probably. Every couple of years somebody buys it and they think, I can do this, and they fix it up. <laughs> and it's about this wide. And, 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 then, and then you see they're gone. And then, and then somebody else buys it and they think, I can do this. And they do it and then they're gone. Um, but it's in a wonderful little house. If you don't know it, you just really just walk to the end of this block, turn around, turn the second house in, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, 75 and a half. 75 and a half on Bedford Street. And and it's a Vincent Malay lived there. And she she survived among all those men she was with all the time, too. Um, another, um, you know, it was tougher. <laughs> Here's another woman who survived. It is my great pleasure to bring you Grace Paley tonight. Um, Grace Paley, of course, is known for her short stories. She's one of the really great geniuses of the 20, 20th century. In my opinion, she's one of the greatest writers, American writers who's ever lived. Um, Grace Paley was the first woman I ever saw read who read like a woman. You know what I'm talking about? She was relating to the audience. She, there were people in the back, and she stopped and said, come here, come here, there's seats here. She chewed gum. <laughs> um, she was, she, it was like, like she just stepped out of her kitchen and came in and was talking to us. And then she began to read, and, and greatness just filled the room. Um, but um, she died in 2007, and it's a, a great loss. She was a political person, a writer. She lived in New York in the West Village for many, many years. And when I adopted my daughter late in my life, um, she also taught at Sarah Lawrence, where I teach. And I said, Grace, where do I bring her to preschool? And she said, Greenwich House, right at the end of your street, Farrow <laughs> Street. Go to Greenwich House. Um, and, uh, and when I said, what do I do about these individual conferences at Sarah Lawrence? She said, see them in groups. It doesn't matter if it's illegal. Just see them in groups. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Here's a poem called Responsibility. It is the responsibility of society to let the poet be a poet. It is the responsibility of the poet to be a woman. It is the responsibility of the poet to stand on street corners giving out poems and beautifully written leaflets, also leaflets they can hardly bear to look at because of the screaming rhetoric. <laughs> it is the responsibility of the poet to be lazy, to hang out and prophesy. It is the responsibility of the poet not to pay war taxes. It is the responsibility of the poet to go in and out of ivory towers and two-room apartments on Avenue C and buckwheat fields and army camps. It is the responsibility of the male poet to be a woman. <laughs> it is the responsibility of the female poet to be a woman. It is the poet's responsibility to speak truth to power, as the Quakers say. It is the poet's responsibility to learn the truth from the powerless. It is the responsibility of the poet to say many times, there is no freedom without justice, and this means economic justice and love justice. It is the responsibility of the poet to sing this and all the original and traditional tunes of singing and telling poems. It is the responsibility of the poet to listen to gossip. 
and pass it on. <laughs> in the way storytellers decant the story of life. There is no freedom without fear and bravery. This is on my refrigerator. There is no freedom without fear and bravery. There is no freedom unless earth and air and water continue and children also continue. It is the responsibility of the poet to be a woman, to keep an eye on the world, and to cry out like Cassandra, but to be listened to this time. <laughs> Grace Taylor. Here, Mary died to a man who lived up in Vermont, her second marriage, and he was just such an astonishingly handsome man, like 85, um, so beautiful, Bob Nichols. Here, here I am in the garden laughing, an old woman with heavy breasts and a nicely mapped face. How did this happen? Well, that's who I wanted to be. At last, a woman in the old style, sitting stout thighs apart under a big skirt, grandchild sliding on off my lap a pleasant summer perspiration. That's my old man across the yard. He's talking to the meter reader. He's telling him the world's sad story, how electricity is oil or uranium and so forth. I tell my grandson, go on over to your grandpa. Ask him to sit beside me for a minute. I am suddenly exhausted by my desire to kiss his sweet, explaining lips. <laughs> and I'll end with this last one. Um, when Grace, uh, I saw Grace a couple of days before she died. She was in Provincetown, Massachusetts. She was a, a huge, uh, 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 she was very involved with the Fine Arts Work Center there, which I am too. And um, she was very, she was about to die in a couple of days, but her daughter Nora told me that as Grace left the, the, the house they were renting for those, that week, she walked through the garden as she left deadheading their flowers. <clears throat> my friend tells me a man in my house jumped off the roof. The roof is the eighth floor of this building. The roof door was locked. How did he manage? His girlfriend had said goodbye, I'm leaving. He was 22. His mother and father were hurrying at that very moment from upstate to help him move out of Brooklyn. They had heard about the girl. The people who usually look up and call, jump, jump, did not see him. The lifesavers who creep around the back staircases and reach the roof's edge just in time never got their chance. He meant it. He wanted only one person to know. Did he imagine that she would grieve all her young life away, tell everyone, this boy I kind of lived with last year, he died on account of me? My friend was not interested. He said, you are always inventing stuff. What I want to know, how could he throw his life away? How do these guys do it just like that? And here I am, fighting this ferocious, insane, vindictive virus all day and night, day and night, and for what? For only one thing, this life, this life. Mm -hmm. Sentences and Rain, all from Coffee House Press. 
And Lane is widely published and anthologized. Her work has appeared in The Nation, Poetry, The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Tin House, several editions of the best American poetry. She teaches at NYU and is an MFA program in the New School. Elaine Eckley. to be here tonight. This is, just, this is wonderful. Um, it's my great pleasure to read two poems by Nina Loy, and then I'm going to read maybe one or two of mine. <clears throat> Mina Loy, as you probably know, was a British modernist poet from the early part of the 20th century. She was also a novelist, a playwright, a feminist, a futurist who critiqued the movement for being too macho, a visual artist, a designer of lamps, and, this is a little known fact, she was the inventor of earmuffs. <laughs> Mina Loy. I don't like to wear hats, so whenever it's cold, I thank Mina Loy. Um, she's a very glamorous cosmopolitan figure. She lived everywhere. She lived in Paris, in Florence, in Argentina, and for several, several years she lived here um, in New York. She moved here to the village in 1916 and was very active in the art scene here. She was friends with Marianne Moore, William Carlos Williams, uh, Marcel Duchamp, and everyone. Later, she moved to the Bowery and continued to be what we would call a downtown poet. <laughs> this is a short poem called Gertrude Stein, and the first word is Curie, like Madame Curie, the physicist. Curie of the laboratory of vocabulary. <laughs> she crushed the tonnage of consciousness, congealed to phrases, to extract a radium of the word. <laughs> I love that poem. <laughs> this is called Property of Pigeons. Pigeons doze or rouse their striped crescendos of gray rainbow, a living freeze on the shallow sill of a factory window. Pigeons arise, alight on vertical bases of civic brick, whitened with avalanches of their innocent excrements, as if an angel had been sick. <laughs> of their corpses. Pigeons make irritant, alluring music, quilled solfeggios of shrill wings winnowing their rejoicing, cooing fanaticism for wooing. Their dolce voices dotage, to and fro, frowardly they live, burnishing each other's gorgeous halters in the feathery drive of preliminaries to their marriages. Pigeons disappear, their claws a coral landing gear, dive for the altar stair to their privacies. A slice of concrete falled on a cornice, leading into darkness, the slit adjacents of houses where the caressive dust, the residue of furnaces upholster the gossamer festoons of intestate spiders for nuptial furniture. <laughs> Pigeons, through some conjurous procedure, appear to reappear upon the altar stair at startling instants in the immature torsos of their giant infants, timid and unflown, stark of plume, naive in nativity to peer into a vast transparency. <coughs> wow, that's a workout to read. <laughs> I'll just read one of mine. I think I'll read. Uh, it's called Muffin of Sunsets, which is a line actually by another New York poet, Joe Chiravolo. Um, it's just kind of like standing around Washington Square Park. Muffin of Sunsets. The sky is melting. Me too. Who hasn't seen it this way? Pink between the castle work of buildings. Pensive syrup drizzled over clouds. 
It is almost catastrophic how heavenly. A million poets, at least, have stood in this very spot, groceries in hand, wondering, can I witness the rapture and still make it home in time for dinner? <laughs> of poetry, most recently The Uses of the Body, which was featured on NPR's All Things Considered and included on the Best of 2015 list by The New Yorker, Vogue, BuzzFeed, and oh, The Oprah Magazine. Ooh. That's awesome. Um, she teaches in and directs the creative writing program at New York University. Her fourth book, Soft Targets, will be out in 2019. to be here with these extraordinary women and these extraordinary poems. Can you hear me in the back? I'm not used to, I'm not an actress. Yeah, you can, you can. Okay, good. So I'm going to read only one poem, um, which is a little bit longer. It's a famous poem by Audre Lorde called Power, and it was written um, after a policeman shot a 10-year-old boy in Queens. And the thing about this poem is that it was written many, many years ago, but uh, could have been written today. Power. The difference between poetry and rhetoric is being ready to kill yourself instead of your children. I am trapped on a desert of raw gunshot wounds and a dead child dragging his shattered black face off the edge of my sleep. Blood from his punctured cheeks and shoulders is the only liquid for miles and my stomach churns at the imagined taste while my mouth splits into dry lips without loyalty or reason, thirsting for the wetness of his blood as it sinks into the whiteness of the desert, where I am lost without imagery or magic, trying to make power out of hatred and destruction, trying to heal my dying son with kisses. Only the sun will bleach his bones quicker. A policeman who shot down a 10-year-old boy in Queens stood over the boy with his cop shoes in childish blood, and a voice said, Die, you little motherfucker, and there are tapes to prove it. At his trial, this policeman said in his own defense, I didn't notice the size nor nothing else, only the color. And there are tapes to prove that, too. Today, that 37-year-old white man with 13 years of police forcing was set free by 11 white men who said they were satisfied justice had, be, had been done, and one black woman who said, they convinced me, meaning they had dragged her four-foot, 10-inch black woman's frame over the hot coals of four centuries of white male approval until she let go the first real power she ever had and lined her own womb with cement to make a graveyard for our children. I have not been able to touch the destruction within me, but unless I learn to use the difference between poetry and rhetoric, my power too will run corrupt as poisonous mold or lie limp and useless as an unconnected wire. And one day I will take my teenage plug and connect it to the nearest socket, raping an 85-year-old white woman who is somebody's mother. And as I beat her senseless and set a torch to her bed, a Greek chorus will be singing in 3-4 time. Poor thing. She never hurt a soul. What beasts they are. introduce Diana Getch, who's written several poetry collections, most recently in America and The Job of Being Everybody. Her works appeared in many leading journals, newspapers and anthologies, including The New Yorker, Poetry, 
the Pushcart Prize Anthology, the LA Times, and many other good places. She's received fellowships from the NEA, NIFA, and is currently the Grace Paley Teaching Fellow at the New School. <laughs> Diana is fortunate to live in the West Village and has since 1993, where she teaches an ongoing poetry workshop on lovely Jane Street. Echo, echo what Deborah said. I've, I've been fortunate recently to be in some great groups of women, and this is one of them. Can people hear me in the balcony? Okay. I'm an old school teacher, so I, I'll try to hit the cheap seats. <laughs> so I chose uh, you know, Rukeyser. We, we all, we all um, went to a Google Docs to, to register our choices so that we don't counterfeit one another. And I was really happy to see that no one had chosen Muriel Rukeyser. And she lived toward the end of her life on Bethune Street in West Bath, which uh, in that huge artist loft at West Bath, which is still an artist loft today. Um, and so I was happy about all of that. And um, so I have two poems by her, and then and one, of, one by me, um, since I'm a West Village poet. Uh, this, this first poem is called Despisals. In the human cities, never again to despise the backside of the city, the ghetto, or build it again as we build the despised backsides of houses. Look at your own building. You are the city. Among our secrecies, not to despise our Jews, that is, ourselves, or our darkness, our blacks, or in our sexuality, wherever it takes us, and we now know we are productive, too productive, too reproductive for our present invention, never to despise the homosexual who goes building another with touch, with touch, not to despise any touch, each like himself, like herself, each. You are this. In the body's ghetto, never to go despising the asshole, nor the useful shit that is our clean clue to what we need. Never to despise the clitoris in her least speech. Never to despise in myself what I have been taught to despise, nor to despise the other, not to despise the it, to make this relation with the it, to know that I am it. So, She's a, a poet, of, I, I think, of, of just heroic empathy. And, you know, normally Ginsburg is sort of given the mantle of Whitman, but I actually think it's Muriel Rukeyser. Um, you know, Whitman could uh, just empathize with anything. And um, here's, here's another poem by Muriel Rukeyser called Saint Roach. <laughs> For that, I never knew you. I only learned to dread you. For that, I never touched you. They told me you were filth. They showed me by every action to despise your kind. For that, I saw my people making war on you. I could not tell you apart, one from another. For that, in childhood, I lived in places clear of you. For that all the people I knew met you by crushing you, stamping you to death. They poured boiling water on you. They flushed you down. For that I could not tell one from another, only that you were dark, fast on your feet, and slender, not like me. For that I did not know your poems and that I do not know any of your sayings, and that I cannot speak or read your language, and that I do not sing your songs, and that I do not teach your children to eat your food, 
or know your poems, or sing your songs, but that we say you are filthing our food, but that we know you not at all. Yesterday, I looked at one of you for the first time. You were lighter than the others in color. That was neither good nor bad. I was really looking for the first time. You seemed troubled and witty. <laughs> Today, I touched one of you for the first time. You were startled. You ran. You fled away, fast as a dancer, light, strange, and lovely to the touch. I reach. I touch. I begin to know you. <laughs> So I'll read you one poem from this book that I wrote at 1 Jane Street, where uh, there are only two rent-stabilized people left, and both of us are artists. Um, this poem is called Recess. A ring of children seated Indian style, a girl deciding which head to tap as she orbits them in her party dress, saying, duck, 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 duck. <laughs> Every boy wants to be the goose, to bolt up and run down this girl before she makes it around to the spot he vacated. Once they saw her trip and fall, exposing a lovely backside covered in lace. Maybe that is why their heads rise like charmed snakes as she passes, saying, duck, 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 duck. <laughs> Annoying the girls in the circle who frown and attracting now the attention of their teacher, leaning against a tree, bringing her gaze down from the clouds where she had been pondering two men, the one she recently broke up with, filling her with regret about the much better, more beautiful one from college. Now she is 29, on perhaps the last warm day of September. The smartest, prettiest girl in the class is going duck Duck, 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 in an endless left hand turn, and she can't figure out whether the girl is powerful or helpless as she blinks back tears and blows the whistle to end this. <laughs> It is now my honor to introduce Stephanie Berger, who is one of the co-sponsors of this uh, with her poetry brothel. And there's a lot of words about Stephanie. I crossed them out. I just wrote, Stephanie Berger is a force of nature. <laughs> She's the CEO of the Poetry Society of New York and co-creator of the poetry brothel, which has gotten the attention of the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Guardian, Refinery29, Bustle, and probably some of you. And she's employed some of us. Um, she's the author of uh, a volume of poems called In the Madam's Hat Box, and the co-author of an interesting <coughs> translation uh, book of poems called The Gray Bird, 13 Emoji Poems in Translation. <laughs> Poetry has appeared in Fence, Hyperallergenic, the Volta Prelude and Pouch Magazine. Um, she's also earned a BA in Philosophy <coughs> and Critical Studies at USC, and she got her MFA right here in our neighborhood at the New School. Stephanie Berger.
there are so many people that have done the Poetry Brothel here today. <laughs> um, and I'm also really honored to be reading with all of you. Um, I chose Alice Notley as my poet. Um, I discovered Alice when I was at the new school. And actually, no one ever taught her work to me. I probably should have taken a class with you, <laughs> Elaine. But um, I was taught Ted Berrigan, Anselm Berrigan, and Edmund Berrigan, <laughs> and kind of just discovered her through all of that. So, family of poets. Um, this was the first poem of hers that I ever read. I was 21, and uh, it's called The Prophet. It is a poem that is just advice and it goes on for pages. I'm only going to read like a little bit of it, um, but I really needed this advice at the time. <clears throat> the Prophet. They say there is a dying star which is traveling in two directions. Don't brood over how you behaved last night. If you can't remember that much about it, don't ask anyone else about it. <laughs> 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 In case you were wonderful in your abandon. Don't gloat if you were wonderful, for you have a hangover, ass. Soon you will be old, and you will still be this childish. It is precisely a tremulous April new day. Things that might be found in a pill bottle include a tiny photograph, a sponge besides being an animal that looks and grows like a plant is a thing in your kitchen sink that comes to smell peculiar and gets neglected to be replaced. Many things like yourself are often misleading, transformed or elsewhere. In the morning when you awaken, your body is already here for you. Some things have, have been made easy for you and some are easier than they seem. If you cannot open a door and it consists of two doors, don't surmise that you are locked in. You can sometimes open such doors by opening both doors at once with long and widespread arms. Many major things are not interesting. Things perhaps not interesting include the drugs we take, the decades that we live in, and current political crises. They are X, the boring to deal with them constantly mentally. Is to dry fuck or is it to dry hump? Not that they have to do with sex. Everyone knows a recipe for something. For example, a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> a recipe may produce breakfast, but I am not nourished by your recipe for my world. Its cruelty is repugnant, or its benignity is like benignity rather than thoughtless, invisible goodness. <laughs> Shut your brain up so I can wash my hair. <laughs> Dignify the world by being beautiful or seriously ugly. There is sometimes a minuscule playing card on the floor. It is face down and blue with stars, and you will never turn it over. To complain of money will ruin your conversation. If you do not complain of money, there is probably something wrong with your life. Perhaps you should call money green zinnias. <laughs> a few hundred more green zinnias, I can fly to Rome at the end of June. Any spare petals? I owe the government thousands of green zinnias and back taxes. As you know, they're not easy to grow in New York City. <laughs> Short poems uh, 
by uh, an unknown poet, radical poet, named Lola Ridge. Uh, at the time of her death, she was deemed one of the most important poets in America by the New York Times in 1941, and most people, as I said, have never read anything of hers. She edited the poetry magazine Broom at East, uh, 3 East 9th Street and others at 21 East 15th. She lived at 17 West 8th Street, 252 West 12th Street, and 296 West 11th Street, oh, and also 47 Morton Street, and some street that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Village was where she left for Yaddo and McDowell in Mexico and New Mexico, and where she returned after begging her way to Baghdad and back. <laughs> where <clears throat> Marianne Moore, William Carlos Williams, uh, uh, Mina Loy, and many other poets collected to fund a, 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 to collected a fund to support her that she refused. She gave wonderful parties, and they all came for parties. And she helped her spy police. Uh, she also recited the poetry at the Provincetown Playhouse. Mm. Uh, she wrote about lynchings, executions, imprisonments, and labor. Uh, so, you know, she's topical. <laughs> uh, I'll read uh, a short poem called Debris. This was written around 1911 when um, there was a terrible depression in New York and also waves of immigrants. She was an immigrant from New Zealand. Debris. I love those spirits that men stand off and point at or shudder and hood up their souls. Those ruined ones where liberty has lodged an hour and passed like flame, bursting asunder the too small house. She also wrote, um, like many, uh, well, actually, like her um, friend and uh, student, Park Crane, who learned a lot from a certain poem of hers called Brooklyn Bridge. Oh. If you go to Columbia and look in the rare book room, for his copy of her book, it falls open to that page and it's stained. He used a lot of her material. Brooklyn Bridge. Pythonous body, arching over the night like an ecstasy. I feel your coils tightening and the world's lessening breath. And um, she was forgotten uh, because of her radicalism, that's to say her politics her um, experimentation, and because she was a woman. It was not a good time to be a woman poet uh, at the beginning of World War II. It took quite a long time before they once, once again rose up. Uh, and uh, this is the end of uh, a poem called uh, The Ghetto, which is in a volume called The Ghetto and Other Poems. It's its 100th anniversary this year, and of course it's about the Lower East Side. But you do not see me who am a torch blown along the wind, flickering to a spark, but never out. And I'll read one poem of my own, another bridge poem, in the genre of bridges. It's called Bridge, comma, Mother. Comma as in, I'm telling you there's a comma not that I <laughs> Mother burns on the other side of the bridge. Mother burns the bridge and is safe on the other side. Mother is not on the bridge when it burns. When mother says burn, the bridge burns. We can't get to the other side. The bridge is burned. Mother is the bridge that we burn. She is how we get to the other side. We can't burn the bridge without her. Mother burns, and we burn. Bridge <coughs> or no bridge. She is the other side. Nothing burns the bridge, and then it burns. April mm -hmm. <laughs> is a poet, novelist, and essayist. She has been the recipient of a Walt Whitman Prize from the Academy of American <coughs> Poets, a Guggenheim Grant, and a Whitney Humanities Center Fellowship. 
Her books of poems are Brawl and Jog, Romanticism, Swan Electric, Songs, and B Blackbird Bye Bye. Her novels are Pirate Jenny and Miss Fuller, which was shortlisted for the International Dublin Literary Award. A frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books and other journals, she is professor of English and director of creating writing at Skidmore College and a member of the faculty at the Bennington MFA Writing Seminars. Everybody's been saying it, but it's really quite incredible to be with the women on this stage, so it's lovely to be here. I came in on the train just in time. Um, and one of the things that I, I'm going to read two poems of Marianne Moore's and then one of my own. And I, I think about Marianne Moore uh, when I think about the city of Losh. You know she lived on St. Luke's Place before they moved to Brooklyn. But before she lived on St. Luke's Place, she was um, a very sheltered uh, existence with her mother and went to an all-women's college. And then when she came to New York, um, she found it overwhelming and kind of difficult. And one of the things that I think that recent biographies of her have done a very good job of ex explicating is, is the issue of poverty. She and her mother lived in a kind of genteel poverty that was very, very hard on them. Sometimes they didn't have enough to eat. And there is something to me about the extraordinary munificence and, and exuberance of her poetry and its richness, and that it comes from a place of great suffering and great privation. And she's making something enormous from that. I'm going to start with a poem of hers called No Swan So Fine in which she expresses her political ambivalence about the bourgeoisie. <laughs> and she also was talking about Louis XV and, and a candelabrum she saw and some photographs of Aceh's of the dead, the dead fountains of Versailles before they did, you know, that before they did the reconstruction of Versailles, there were these famous Aceh photographs of the fountains and everything looking dead and terrible. She was looking at those and then kind of in the middle of thought, she wrote, no swan so fine. No water so still as the dead fountains of Versailles. No swan with swart blind look askance and gondoliering legs so fine as the chintz china one with fawn brown eyes and toothed gold collar on to show whose bird it was. Lodged in the Louis XV candelabrum tree of Cox, coxcomb tinted buttons, dahlias, sea urchins, and everlastings. It perches on the branching foam of polished, sculptured flowers, at ease and tall. The king is dead. <laughs> um, and then uh, I want to read you Sojourn in the Whale. Now, she was, of course, thinking of Jonah hanging out in the whale. But this, she wrote this, it's a poem from her uh, youth, and she wrote it shortly after, um, in the teens, um, after the Easter uprising in Ireland. The poem is about Ireland, Ireland figured as a woman, and herself, <laughs> all in the same kind of overlapping. And I think, I finally figured out, when I was teaching this for the umpteenth time, that the reason she thought of Ireland as being inside of a whale at least perhaps initially, is because if you look at the map of England, you can see that it's about to swallow Ireland. Um, she referred to her own major visit to New York when she was young, before she moved here, as her sojourn in the whale. It was very difficult for her. She experienced, as I say, she came from a somewhat sheltered background. She experienced the artists and the art, everything exciting in New York, but she also experienced, I think, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm extrapolating from what I've read, but I think she experienced herself as a woman coming up against male art culture at the same time. So this is uh, called Sojourn in the Whale. Trying to open locked doors with a sword, threading the points of needles, planting shade trees upside down, swallowed by the opaqueness of one whom the seas love better than they love you, Ireland. You have lived and lived on every kind of shortage. You have been compelled by hags to spin gold thread from straw and have heard men say, there is a feminine temperament 
in direct contrast to ours, which makes her do these things. <coughs> Circumscribed by a heritage of blindness and native incompetence, she will become wise and will be forced to give in. Compelled by experience, she will turn back. Water seeks its own level. And you have smiled. Water in motion is far from level. You have seen it. When obstacles happened to bar the path, rise automatically. And um, as someone who has, uh, <laughs> as someone who has come and gone from New York and and lived, I lived in 437 East 12th Street for 10 years. I lived um, at Grove and Bedford for five blissful years. Um, and have been more or less exiled to the provinces since then. Um, I come to you from, at the moment, Saratoga Springs, but I also lived for years in Amherst and Bennington, going from job to job like Mother Courage. And um, this, uh, this poem is, uh, is inspired by the Tang poets, um, many of, whom, of, the, of the Chinese Tang dynasty, many of whom, uh, there was a kind of a style a grouchy old man poem um, <laughs> complaining about being in exile and no longer in favor at court. And I, I thought I could write something in the style, in the manner of the Tang poets. And this is Who Falters. Where is the laughter that once lit and shook my house like rain sliding off the leaves after a storm? Who falters as she lifts her hand? Where, for that matter, is the sun? This much is certain. Nameless I have become and without kin. I fought my battles under the emperor's pennant. Then I fought my friends, all of them, until they left me too. The capital city, where we thrived, survives in name only. Crazy rich people have colonized it, like seabirds covering a rocky isthmus with white slick streaks and incalculable din. I grasp my own hand that for once I might touch flesh. Did you hear that sharp knock at the door? enormous pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Macklin, who gave us a very, very skimpy bio. She's the author of two books of poetry, fabulous books, I'm adding that, A Woman Kneeling in the Big City, and You've Just Been Told, and she's a translator from the Basque of Kirmen Uribe's Meanwhile Take My Hand and Other Works. I will also add that she is an old friend of mine, a brilliant woman, uh, has worked for years as a copy editor at The New Yorker. Um, is, has received an Amy Lowell Traveling Fellowship at Guggenheim, and, and it's still not enough. Elizabeth Macklin. <laughs> she married to the Upper West Side. <laughs> and, and it, uh, it takes place on 6th Avenue and on her block between 6th and 7th. And, uh, and it's from her book, May Day, uh, from 2008. And uh, we'll, we all will recognize which morning it was. That morning, a woman leaned against a wall sobbing, the people, the people. A broken urn lay on its side, the soil spilling out, the roots of the plant exposed, though its form remained intact. There was a birch a block away that I fled to, a shoal of light shivering in its leaves, a scroll peeling from its skin. I returned to the street where I lived to see a man sitting down on his briefcase. He was staring out at something. I couldn't speak to him. 
a gulf opened between us as he peered into the distance, into the air. I could taste the future, a taste of impossible things. Then I went into Antonio's cafe. His mother made coffee for everyone, refusing to take any money. She was waiting for a call from her son. A man with a big portfolio stepped in, walking over to the bar where we sat. We waited together, looking down at the marble, looking up at the television screen, though what we saw was happening outside. We needed to be near each other under the circumstances. The man with the big portfolio pointed to the screen and said, this means war, his declaration harboring a wild, cold joy, his jaw an engine of resolve. Some of us put two and two together. Hadn't there been a storm the night before? Rain, so much rain, gushing from gutters, flooding our shoes. Isn't that why the urn overturned? Isn't that why there wasn't a cloud in the sky? One by one we left, going our separate ways into the air that for many weeks was not the air we knew. I was very glad of the other Rukeyser poems. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, 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 uh, for, and, uh, I had never known that she lived in West Beth. And uh, this, this is a poem I dearly love from her 1968 book, uh, The Speed of Darkness. Uh, uh, and it's, it's startling to, even then there were devices. It's called Poem. I lived in the first century of world wars. You have it, please? Poem. I lived in the first century of world wars. Most mornings I would be more or less insane. The newspapers would arrive with their careless stories. The news would pour out of various devices, interrupted by attempts to sell products to the unseen. I would call my friends on other devices. They would be more or less mad for similar reasons. Slowly I would get to pen and to paper, make my poems for others unseen and unborn. In the day I would be reminded of those men and women brave, setting up signals across vast distances, considering a nameless way of living, of almost unimagined values. As the lights darkened, as the lights of night brightened, we would try to imagine them, try to find each other, to construct peace, to make love, to reconcile, waking with sleeping, ourselves with each other, ourselves with ourselves. We would try by any means to reach the limits of ourselves, to reach beyond ourselves, to let go of the means, to wake. I lived in the first century of these wars. from our hostess, uh, 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 Edna St. Vincent Millay. Uh, uh, come to find out she uh, published this poem uh, just after the end of the First World War uh, in the May issue of Poetry Magazine uh, in uh, 1919, the Walt Whitman Centennial issue. I've always wondered why she called it a recuerdo. Uh, uh, it was first co collected in her 1922 book, uh, A Few Figs from Thistles. Recuerdo. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. It was bare and bright and smelled like a stable 
but we looked into a fire. We leaned across a table. We lay on a hilltop underneath the moon, and the whistles kept blowing, and the dawn came soon. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry, and you ate an apple, and I ate a pear. From a dozen of each we had bought somewhere. And the sky went wan, and the wind came cold, and the sun rose dripping, a bucket full of gold. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. We hailed, good morrow, mother, to a shawl-covered head, and bought a morning paper, which neither of us read. And she wept, God bless you for the apples and the pears. And we gave her all our money but our subway fares. <laughs> and in television. Uh, she has received a Tony nomination for her performance of Beatrice in New York Shakespeare's production of Much Ado About Nothing, and has been awarded two Obies, a Lucille Lortel, and a Drama Desk Award, and is the recipient of four Emmy nominations for her performances on television. Uh, Kathleen has lived in Greenwich Village for more than 60 years, and is honored to be a part of this evening's festivities, she says. <laughs> to all my life, uh, and this is so, I'm so blessed to be surrounded by this, this lovely energy, feeling, warmth, and, and lovely observation of life. Uh, this is something that I've written. Um, as you were told, I've lived in the village for over 60 years. I've lived on every street in the village. <laughs> I've slept. The church, the Episcopal Church on 11th Street. <laughs> I, I, I had free hamburgers at Bigelow's when there was a, 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 a luncheonette there and sat with the ladies who were going to the prison <laughs> Jefferson Market. Um, I've just been in the village for a very long time. And this, this story is about when I first moved to New York early on. Was that one of the first people that I had really uh, was unlike someone that I had ever known from the small town in which I came from. Her name is Lucille. And this is a story about Lucille. The other evening, nostalgia, my constant companion on sleepless nights, forced me to wander towards the river to what was left of the meat market and what was once my old neighborhood how chic it had become, <clears throat> tightly fretted over with restaurants that had resuscitated themselves with fashionable trends and exorbitant prices. Limousines and Harley Davidson motorcycles attached to investment bankers <laughs> took the place of the big, gruff, hard-working trucks tamed by red-faced, strong-working men. The river had a foul breath. And the authentic voice of the meat market had been silenced. I remember not so long ago, when I lived way west on Horatio Street, the wind from the river was fresh, and the lights from the meat market in the early hours of the morning turned the yellow fading moon to the color of quince. The mafia, an occasional gunshot, <laughs> and a few bedroom slippered feet found squashed in the street, stopped more than a few people from eating chop meat in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Only the very young and the very old would not wake at 4 a.m. when the trucks from the meat market stampeded up Horatio Street like wild elephants bellowing, causing the windows to rattle and the spices to jump off my 
spice rack. <laughs> Almost simultaneously, along the pavement, a rhythmic scratch would begin in whatever silence the trucks allowed. And through the tattered curtains of my lace window, my lace curtains of my bedroom window, I would see her. Like Titania in Midsummer Night's Dream, fussing up fairy breasts with her wand. I would see Lucille sweeping the streets. Lucille was a huge woman, not only in size, but with a persona so large that it couldn't help but overflow into another small guarded space. Once at a long gone Italian restaurant called Bacci on McDougal Street, I saw a painting of Lucille. There was a bare earth bocce court in the back of the restaurant where graceful, clean shaven old Italian men played bocce while disheveled would be poets and artists argued and slurped up massive amounts of pasta for under a dollar. Lucille's picture <coughs> hung on the far end of a long court. The obscure artist had painted her as Gulliver from Gulliver's Travels. <laughs> the giant tied down by the tiny Lilliputians. But I didn't know Lucille then, nor did I connect the picture with her until long after I had known her. The picture had a foreboding quality about it, a sadness that touched me, and I remembered it. When I first met Lucille, she was still proudly posing her voluminous body, nude body for money, and because she was the super of a small complex of apartments, she lived rent-free. These apartments were in two dirt-stained red brick buildings across the street from where I lived. One building faced the front of the street, the other a slovenly, small, three-story building adorned with a broken fire escape was hidden in the back. <coughs> the entrances to both buildings were accessed through a long, damp alleyway that led to a courtyard. The courtyard was cluttered with a dissembled Oregon box, Lucille's, <laughs> and odds and ends of rusted, indistinguishable carts left and forgotten. Corners were piled high with old green plastic flower pots, some still holding dead poinsettias from Christmases long ago, and ivy too tired to climb. Courageously like a brave old New Yorker, Coming up from the cracked cement, a feeble but persistent alanthus tree complemented when in bloom the permanent smell of cactus. <laughs> Perpetually pregnant cats belong to Lucille, along with Tony, the dog, and a husband whose name was Albert. Albert was as thin as Lucille was fat. In spite of the dangling moles and other various scrofula growing on his skin and lumps protruding from his long mane of unkempt hair, he could have been an attractive man. He was rather like an Horatio Street version of the beautiful French actor, Gerard Philippe, but very down and very out. Albert didn't work. He did nothing because of some rare disease that Lucille allowed him to have. <laughs> she kept him. Both Albert and Lucille came from some small, long borough like Queens. They celebrated their lack of material possessions by proclaiming themselves bohemians, unconventional. Albert fell deeper, <coughs> deeper into the unconventional. He was a recluse and rarely left the apartment. But Lucille would not, could not. Be contained. <laughs> she padded along the street with a limp in one of her two long and faded blue dresses, coming home in the early evening from some free concert or some obscure rally for justice. Her familiar silhouette weighted down on both sides with bags of marrow bones and chicken wings for the animals, her favorite after the fall apple juice. and rescued pieces of shiny treasures found along the streets. The West Village Nursery School inhabited a brownstone in the same block as Lucille and myself, and these found treasures would appear on the school's doorstep. 
transformed into animals and other shapes that perhaps only children understood. Lucia was not welcomed into the school. She appeared to be unclean and dangerously broke the barrier of behavior that was acceptable. Her size, her passion, her uncontrolled and intense articulation of what she believed to be true, her black eyes that demanded contact disturbed most people. Deeply involved in the politics of the West Village, more than once she threatened to throw her huge body in the way of anyone or anything that would build a highway that now exists along the Hudson River. Barred constantly from the West Village committee meetings <laughs> because of her disruptive impatience, she would force her way back into the meetings and make herself heard. Twenty coveted Japanese cherry trees, you can see them this spring, were fought for and planted on Horatio Street by and because of Lucille. Lucille talked incessantly. <laughs> Even when her voice became hoarse, she would force the words out in a whisper. <laughs> there was no subject that she did not have endless facts, knowledge, and passionate opinions about. <coughs> Scientific data, political theories, she was a Reichian anarchist, a Marxist, a Marxist. All forms of psychoanalytic theory, artistic creation, the bullshit of Dr. Spock, <laughs> and how the lack of orgasms cause women to have thick legs. <laughs> <laughs> tentatively, yuppie neighborhood found Lucille unsavory. I found her fascinating. In spite of her bravado, I could see that the I could see the embarrassment of the way her weight made her feel vulnerable. I sensed her awareness that whatever it was she longed for would not happen. And still she continued to hope. I was intrigued by the smell of her skin, the scent like the smell of wet earth in the spring, slightly fetid and buttery, lingered, intimate, yet elusive. Her thin black hair pulled back into a bun. It was long and private. Once I caught a glimpse of her after she had washed her hair, excuse me, letting the long straggling pieces fall to her waist. Drying her hair in the warmth of the courtyard's pale sun, she was quiet. I had never seen her quiet before. <laughs> she looked like a young girl, shy and beautiful. Though childless, she loved children, and my daughter loved her. I, much to the horror of the other mothers in the neighborhood, was the first to let Lucille babysit for me. <laughs> Whole cooked roasts! and other goodies would disappear from the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> Even the bone would be taken home to Tony the dog. The piano tuner charged me extra to repair the abused keys of my piano. Lucille, spreading the wealth, invited the aspiring neighborhood rock star to pound away at my piano when I was no longer there. Though all was forgiven when she would appear at my daughter's birthday parties almost floating from the sky. Like a joyous article, her head wreathed in flowers, most likely revived from some garbage can. Her massive bulk in rainbow-colored trailing fluffs of fabric of dreams, delighting us with all the stars and bubbles. Defending our inability to easily function in the real world, and with all the arrogance of youth, my husband and I imagined ourselves just unique. Lucille became our bulwark against the outside world. My husband and I were both actors. We were Romeo and Juliet. Acting together, we played all of Shakespeare's young lovers for Joe Papp at his free Shakespeare festival in Central Park. Even when we didn't invite Lucille to our performances, she would show up and sit in the front row along with a <laughs> raunchy, park derelicts who were the first in line to get treated. <laughs> <laughs> Most 
always we would hear Lucille's voice over the loudspeaker wafting backstage, arguing, arguing with an usher, demanding two street seats because of her size. <laughs> Lucille analyzed every gesture I made on stage. As if I were Eleonora Duza or Sarah Bernhardt, and as if my husband were John Barrymore. Our young egotistical selves, hungry for this flattery, began to confide in Lucille. <laughs> Together and separately, on long hot summer evenings on Horatio, we would sit on the stoop, I with my daughter asleep in my arms, my husband and Lucille arguing about politics, the absolute finality of death, and whether my daughter could do her own sweet version of a heart should be shown to draw it correctly. My husband was as stubborn as Lucia was opinionated. His righteous cotton mather descendancy would stand his ground against Lou's raging Sicilian ancestry until eventually his Harvard articulation would crumble and lose all composure against Lucille's street <coughs> smarts. This would go on far into the night. Whether it was because of the gratuitous sexual freedom of the 60s or the, the foreboding ending of Romeo and Juliet, my marriage did not last. During that fragile time of raising my daughter alone, Lucille's telephone number became synonymous with help. Selfishly, I called her at all times of the day and night, not only to ask for a babysitter, but to sob and sometimes to laugh with her to soothe my overwhelming loneliness, and I'm sure in perfect iambic pentameter, like Juliet, <coughs> to dramatically question at age 24 my destiny and my mortality. <laughs> we moved away from Horatio Street, and though my daughter was becoming too old for a babysitter, we kept in touch with Lucille. Albert died. Tony the dog, Lucille, and all the cats moved to the room on the second floor of the crumbling back building. My daughter and I would come to visit. We were proud of Lucille. We would show her off, sitting among her collections of worn out relics and pyramids of papers that would make even the Collier brothers envious. <laughs> <laughs> she would pass approval or not on a lover, a boyfriend. We would drink to meet her. If they were blinded to Lucille's qualities, they were not for us. One rainy summer night, my daughter, on her way to introduce Lucille to the man to whom she is now married, was stopped on the corner of Horatio Street and Greenwich by a policeman, an ambulance, a police cars, people lined the street as they brought out a bagged body on the stretcher. It was Lucille. Her door was not forced. It was assumed the murderer, who to this day has not been found, was someone that she knew. Mm -hmm. Nothing was taken except her joyous, fierce well of spit and flowers, her voice, her verbosity. Lucille's throat had been cut. When I heard the echo of the lost, authentic voice of the meat market, that sleepless night, it reminded me of the silence of Lucille. My daughter, an artist, still draws crooked hearts. Though Lucille was wrong about the finality of death, often her telephone number comes to mind. I dial it. It rings. No one answers. Whoever owns the telephone number now doesn't have an answering machine. I'm grateful for that. I, uh, I, it's, it's, it's hard to come after all that, but I, I, I want to thank these extraordinary women for their voices and their time and their care. And, um, and thank you all for being here tonight.